everybody. So <clears throat> I am um, doing this video because this morning I um, saw a thing about uh, Amazon did one of their uh, big hardware reveals um, apparently this uh, yesterday um, here in Seattle. And um, one of the big things that I saw was um, this article on um, taking away the headache from smart home technology. Um, and that being the goal of, um, of Amazon with a couple of new things that they're doing. Um, and I just wanted to talk about that um, a little bit. Um, because if you know me or you've seen any of my videos, you might have noticed a trend where um, I am super into uh, smart home technology and IoT. Um, <clears throat> so I do um, a lot of that stuff for uh, projects that I do within the maker community. Um, I've done some of that stuff for escape rooms um, and uh, uh, more importantly, I've actually, uh, most of the experiments that I've done with um, smart home tech um, has been in my own home. So pretty much for about um, the past four years, uh, I've been living with smart home technology and slowly building up um, all of the, the connected devices that I currently have in my home. Um, and, and I've learned a lot of things uh, <clears throat> based on that. Um, not everything's worked out, um, but I've got a, a pretty good mesh of devices um, that I'm very happy with uh, with my smart home. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what um, the article mentioned uh, and what some of the video clips from this uh, had mentioned. Uh, about what Amazon is is looking to do um, to help relieve the headache of uh, smart home technology and IoT. Um, one of their solutions is basically um, creating development standards um, and access standards um, that need to be deployed or that devices need to align with in order to work within um, the Google ecosystem, um, or sorry, Android, uh, sorry, uh, Amazon's ecosystem for IoT um, using Alexa. <clears throat> so I apologize in advance, I'm probably gonna be saying Alexa a few times. So if you do have um, one of the Amazon devices, uh, it may just um, listen in. And of course, then they'll know exactly what it is that I have to say uh, about their products. So, um, essentially, um, that's really where a lot of it is going, is uh, making sure that devices comply with rules and um, and um, uh, connection um, steps that uh, Amazon is putting in place for use with their device. Uh, that's really not a new path to take when it comes to relieving the things that actually do provide um, significant amount of difficulty when it comes to smart homes. Um, <clears throat> Really, that's the thing that that that's been the dream of all of these um, smart home technology companies um, is that we're going to set the guidelines and you're going to follow those guidelines in order to make it easier for customers to use your Internet connected products um, within our ecosystem. Um, as you can see, it's pretty much got us to where we are today. Um, where we have the, the major players are um, Amazon HomeKit, um, Google Home, um, Samsung SmartThings. Um, those are the major consumer um, systems uh, that are in place. And if you are going to do a smart home, 
that is going to have any level of sophistication um, on the consumer market. Um, those are your options. Uh, none of them directly interface with each other. Um, and all of them are competing to get manufacturers of light bulbs and um, cameras, um, thermostats, um, electrical, internet connected electrical outlets, um, uh, smart locks. Um, they're all trying to get um, those manufacturers to comply with what makes it easiest um, for the way that Google is trying to do a thing or the way that Amazon is trying to do a thing or HomeKit or any of these other uh, <clears throat> any of these other groups. Um, and it, it's really it's that kind of thinking has really helped to make um, smart home technology extremely frustrating um, because um, typically most people will find themselves in a situation where um, they want to use um, Google Home but Google Home doesn't necessarily support devices in the same way that HomeKit would um, or there might be more hoops that you have to jump over or jump through to get it to work with one ecosystem versus another. Um, now, you know, in, in my opinion, um, each of these companies should do a really good job of creating a network hub that is responsible for communicating with all of these other devices um, using a unified language. Um, now, fortunately enough, we know what that unified language should be. At least most people in the, in the IoT community do. Um, this is a very similar situation to um, what was happening when we started networking computers together. Um, so if you'll... Um, basically, there is... Um, a protocol called HTTP um, that is widely used over the internet. And um, what it does is it makes it so that you don't have to go to a different, um, a, a different web page to view content on a computer or on a smartphone um, or, um, or, or any other device where you can, you can view content on. Um, they just use a generic web browser that uses uh, HTTP um, in order to display web content. Um, and that web content comes in many different forms. Um, it can come in the form of HTML. It can come in the form of a movie, an audio clip, um, JavaScript, you name it. Basically, um, there's lots of different things um, that are compatible with a browser that supports HTTP um, communication protocol. Um, before that was a thing, um, I am old enough to remember that on my cell phone, uh, one of my early cell phones um, did have a web browser, um, but it used what we call WAP, um, W-A-P. Um, if you wanted to display a mobile um, a, a website on a mobile device, um, you would have to actually design um, an entirely different web page um, that would be compatible with a WAP browser. Um, of course, that's not the thing anymore. Um, this is kind of what, in my mind, is happening with IoT right now. Uh, we have this very fractured uh, infrastructure that's going on. Um, things are very difficult to deal with. Um, no one's really communicating with um, each other in um, in a unified way. Um, we're relying on this API to communicate with this API and then um, you know eventually if you go through enough APIs you're gonna get your message from one device to another. Um, it, it creates this huge um, 
massively complex tool chain um, for network administrators. It's it's just it's not good. Um, the way that uh, uh, most people do it um, within the maker community um, and uh, in industrial practices um, and even um, with uh, organizations like NASA that are communicating between devices, um, most of those devices are using something like MQTT. Um, that has kind of um, emerged as the go-to communication standard for a lot of these like um, networked devices. Um, it works very well um, because the messaging itself is very generic. Um, it um, is very good at being able to send uh, information from one device to multiple devices. Um, without having to do a lot of um, network administration uh, in order to do that. Um, the, the key to MQTT is in basically making sure that um, you are using consistent naming conventions with the feeds that you're communicating with. Um, so that if I, if I want to send an information from a switch to a light bulb, the switch needs to send that information as switch and the light bulb needs to know to receive information from a feed called switch. Um, and, and really that's like an overview of about as complex as, as these things can get. Um, you don't need to actually build the thing that, that does, um, that, that handles switch, um, simply by this switch telling the system that it is going to be using this feed switch that feed is created if it isn't if it doesn't exist already um, it, it has a lot of different ways of, of ensuring that your information does get to the device that you're sending it to um, and it does actually remarkably well um, in spite of a, a lot of the trouble that uh, wireless uh, data transmission ends up having um, in the place that I live, um, I have horrible, uh, Wi-Fi interference on the, um, the 2.4, uh, Wi-Fi band. Um, there's a lot of, uh, wave interference, um, that occurs here because lots of people are just willy nilly putting their, uh, adjusting their radios to, whatever setting they think um, is going to work best. Um, so there's a lot of interference here. I get a lot of packet drops um, with that. Um, but my IoT devices that use MQTT um, don't really see that effect um, that much. Um, they consistently work. Um, if I send a command to it, um, I'm pretty sure it's going to work. Um, my light behind me, hey Google, turn on the bench light it turns on just fine this is using MQTT it's not a smart light it is just a uh, sawn off uh, network switch that um, I reprogrammed to use MQTT within my local network um, and then of course through home assistant that's what's connecting to Google to allow voice commands Hey Google, turn off bench light. Um, so as you can see, that works fine. Um, that's only one very simple device um, out of all the devices I have here at home. Um, so MQTT works really well. Um, it is set to work on um, over Bluetooth low energy, um, over Wi-Fi for sure, uh, over Ethernet. Um, and uh, a, a bunch of different types of uh, network um, network types. Um, the important thing that I think um, makes something like MQTT very valuable is um, its ability to work on a lot of different devices. Uh, it doesn't matter what coding language you're using for it, so long as it has some sort of library or support for MQTT, 
these two devices can communicate with each other. Um, it is super easy to get something that uses Circuit Python um, to work with MQTT, um, something that uses just regular Arduino um, code, um, Raspberry Pis, um, my computers, uh, my cell phone, um, pretty much like anything can work on MQTT. Um, so long as there is a library to support it and there's pretty much libraries for everything. It's been around for a long time. Um, so it does have a, a tremendous amount of support, um, even creating the servers. So MQTT does require that you have a server, um, that acts as what we call a broker. Um, and then every other device connects to that, um, server as a client. Um, the brokers, um, you know, of course there are uh, things like, uh, I believe AWS has, uh, an MQTT broker. Um, I'm pretty pov uh, positive that, um, Azure has a, um, an MQTT broker. Um, Adafruit has a free MQTT broker. A lot of places do, um, have free MQTT brokers that you can use to a limited extent. Um, but honestly, like it, it takes me all of about 20 minutes to get my own small MQTT server, uh, working on a Raspberry Pi. I even have them running on a, uh, Pi zero with Wi-Fi, uh, and they work perfectly fine. Um, it's not quite as secure as, um, a lot of the, um, the kind of, uh, business level, um, MQTT servers, and it can't handle quite as much traffic, but I mean, it, it does the job, uh, for what I need it to do. And, um, I think using more technology like that is really what's going to take away a lot of the headache, uh, for smart home technology, um, being able to use a unified protocol so that, um, I don't have to be concerned if my light bulb, um, can interface correctly with this infrastructure or the other, um, that's like, that's a much bigger issue than just telling everyone you need to follow our rules or you're not going to be able to play with our system. Um, which is really to me what, um, Amazon is saying with their announcement for that. Um, now, uh, the other thing realistically that, that I kind of have, um, opinions on when it comes to things that are a genuine headache to deal with, with IOT and smart home devices, um, is, um, I, I definitely would agree is a lot of the setup stuff. Um, now, um, when things go right, they work very well. Um, it is a nice experience. Typically with most, most devices, you're going to connect it to some sort of power source, and then you will connect from a mobile device, um, over Wi-Fi or over Bluetooth low energy to that device in order to enter in your Wi-Fi credentials. And from there, it's able to connect to your Wi-Fi network and you're able to interact with it, um, through your network. Um, and, um, that can be a very easy experience. Um, but it can also go horribly wrong and it does. Um, it depends on the device that you're working with, but I have had many frustrating days of trying to, um, just hammer out a connection, um, with a consumer, uh, smart home product. Um, I'm not really going to name any names for, for which ones they are because, um, nothing is really, um, exempt from this. Um, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Um, specifically when it comes to light bulbs, I, uh, use the LifeX light bulbs and, um, I've actually used LifeX since kind of their earlier versions of the bulbs, um, all the way up to the newer ones, uh, that they have now. <clears throat> I've even used some of the, the light tiles, um, that they produced, but, um, uh, and it's definitely gotten better, 
um, it, it's more consistent. Uh, it is very rare that any of my lights, um, once connected, um, have to be reconnected um, or have trouble connecting to my network, even if I have a power outage uh, or something like that. Um, but, um, but things do go wrong. And um, with a lot of these devices, there's really nothing that you can do. Um, in order to troubleshoot this stuff in any way. Um, the suggestions usually are um, power cycle your device, master reset your device, update the app on your phone, power cycle your phone, power cycle your network adapter. Um, it, it essentially comes down to, have you tried turning it on and off again? Um, which is is there's not usually a way to go much further than that with a lot of these consumer devices and honestly it is one of the most frustrating things um, when it comes to dealing with smart home um, technology um, having the ability to simply plug your device into a computer via usb and edit a configuration file to physically add your Wi-Fi credentials um, would completely fix this issue um, so that you're not relying on, I hope that this network is going to connect to this other network so that it can pull the network settings for my network. Um, that's, um, you know, it, it's great when it works, like I said, but uh, it doesn't always work. And, um, and it can be extremely ag aggravating when you've spent an entire day trying to figure out why this one light bulb is not connecting um, to the network. Um, and, um, and yeah, so that, that's, that is really a huge headache um, when it comes to IoT. Uh, that's not gonna be solved by the things that um the things that amazon is proposing um but uh, another thing that um that does become a really large headache and is a, a big concern within the iot community is um, the current practice of using apis um, and internet connections to apis for every device in your home um, now, there are some devices that, that definitely um, benefit from getting access to the internet in one way or another. Um, but let's face it, if you've got 14 light bulbs in your house and every single one of those light bulbs needs its own internet connection to communicate with a server way out over here, um, that's not a great way to set up your network. Um, especially not when you have um, potentially a, a router that has a massive amount of local bandwidth um, that can be used very easily. Um, there are other concerns about security and um, trying to reduce data traffic um, outside of your network um, that, that go along with this. but. Um, really the solution to this problem, a few companies have started doing this where, um, you know, certainly having an API uh, for your device makes it very easy to set up um, if you're starting. Um, so for example, if you want to just start and get a single full color light bulb that you'd like to put in your living room so that you can, you know, play around with some IoT stuff, that's fine. That Remote API is definitely the way to get started with it um, because you are going to be able to hopefully plug in that light bulb, connect it to the internet, and be able to uh, do some interesting things um, with that API. Um, but the challenge comes when that is the only option um, that you have is using this remote API whether you are at home on your local network or outside at a, uh, at a remote location. Um, 
company, one of the biggest reasons I really like LifeX is because um, you can use that API um, to make it very easy to set up, um, or you can control it locally and remove that light bulb from the cloud and use it only within your local network. And like me, if you have um, a server set up um, for uh, governing your smart home tech, I use Home Assistant. Um, home Assistant is then able to locally communicate with that, those LifeX light bulbs and, um, and give control um, to my home assistant. Um, now benefits of this is that if I am at home, um, I am not connecting to the internet in order to control my lights. Um, it is all connected within my local Wi-Fi network, which means I am not using up bandwidth from my internet service provider. Um, the other advantage to that is that I'm not using the internet. So if the internet goes down and in my neighborhood it does go down, um, I still have control over my lights um, because I don't need to go outside of my network in order to get information to it. Um, uh, a lot of the pushback that I get um, from that is people say they want to be able to control their lights from outside their house. Um, this does not eliminate that as a possibility. Um, my server has a secure connection um, that goes out um, that I can access through my cell phone uh, in order to control my home. Um, the difference is I don't have 12 of those connections going out from each individual light bulb. I have a single connection going out from my, my home assistant server. Um, and that is what allows me to communicate with all the light bulbs in here and all the other uh, smart home tech that I have. Um, so I get the best of both worlds. Um, the thing with providing that is that it just gives us more options. Um, and I think that's really important to make things more accessible when it comes to smart home technology because um, the, uh, the API hosting for a lot of these devices is just not sustainable. Um, you're talking about selling a, a $50 light bulb probably every five to 10 years, um, but the company is, is left having to provide support um, and the, the physical um, computers for running that API indefinitely. Um, and that doesn't work. Like, how are they running those servers um, if they're not, um, you know, maybe they're selling your data um, and, and it's doing data farming, um, which I mean, you know, is not, is not that great. But it, a lot of us are concerned that it just doesn't work um, in the long term. Um, and what uh, we're suspecting is going to happen is that eventually a lot of these uh, companies that make these products are going to start charging, um, say, a monthly fee for use of their API. Uh, in other terms, uh, essentially, you would pay $50 for a light bulb, and then you would also have to pay $5 per month in order to actually use that light bulb. Um, now. I personally think that there are people um, out there that would do that. Um, they would be up for paying that $5 a month fee um, for use of the API uh, for convenience sake. They don't want to run a server. They just want to plug in the light and they want it to work. And if it costs them $5 a month, so be it. Um, the, uh, but you're going to... Um, a company that does that is really going to limit themselves um, because not everyone is going to be okay with that. Um, I would never be okay with that. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and so giving them another option is a way to not isolate these people 
and push them away from your product. Um, so like LifeX, providing the ability to use that API or not use that API and set up your own system um, for, uh, for networking um, is, is a great way to relieve a lot of the headaches and a lot of the stress um, <clears throat> that, that comes from um, the unnecessary internet traffic, the security concerns, the privacy concerns, um, this concern about things like Big Brother um, and big data. Um, that alone is going to take care of things. So these are, see, there's some really um, real things that can be done um, and actually pretty easy things that can be done um, to take the headache away from um, smart home technology and IoT. Um, so one, um, make the setup, uh, give more options for setup so it isn't just hoping that the app works and everything connects. Um, have some actual real um, setup options uh, available to ensure that you can actually get things connected. Um, two, give the option to use your own local connection um, and, uh, and not have to rely on another company's uh, servers and their maintenance of those servers. And three is use a established standard for communication um, that makes it so that uh, all of your devices will work with any other device that you want to um, and do it in a secure way. Um, this takes a lot of the research and the trial and error and guesswork and frustration that a lot of people have with IoT. Um, and that's really, you know, if we're, if we're talking about taking away the headache of IoT, um, that's what it's, that's what is a better use of our time um, to fix those problems. Um, now, on another note, I would say um, one other thing that really bugs me uh, about the current state of consumer IoT is that um, there is a severe lack of um, devices um, that are actually useful out there. Uh, it is um, definitely very disheartening to me that um, the most um, sought after devices with uh, smart home technology are things like smart cameras and um, <clears throat> And, and to be honest, like, I mean, that's when you look at, at the most talked about hardware, um, it is going to be network cameras. Um, it confuses me because we always talk about invasion of privacy and Big Brother, and yet I see people saturating their homes with security cameras um, and, then, uh, and then tying it to a system that they don't necessarily understand. Um, smart homes aren't about security. It isn't about um, it isn't about reviewing video footage or facial recognition or notifying when there's someone at your front door. Um, it's about being able to walk into your home and have the lights turn on, being able to sit down and watch Netflix and have your lights automatically dim. There are so many amazing things um, that you can do when smart home technology is implemented correctly. Um, and I love having people over at my house um, and being able to, to just do the things that I've kind of learned to take for granted um, that my house can do because of the system that I put in place. Um, and having people just be amazed at like, like, what the heck is this? Like, we just sat down in front of your TV and started watching a movie and automatically the lights started fading down. And then if I pause the movie, the lights automatically fade up. Um, and then fade back down again as soon as you start playing the movie or fade up when the movie is all over with. Um, but 
those kind of things are awesome and they amaze people and that's what i want people to experience with smart home technology um <clears throat> i mean you know they they have the new um the new alexa clock um that has a little digital clock in there and you can tap the top um, to hit snooze um, my alarm clock is tied into my home automation system so that uh, it reads events on my Google Calendar, um, which then triggers a wake-up sequence that consists of a sunrise routine from a cloud light that hangs over my bed. Um, and I did actually have uh, audio of birds chirping um, and uh, until my girlfriend, of course, said that she she hated that and uh, made me disable it. Um, but uh, my coffee maker starts making coffee um, and then tells me when that coffee is done. Um, and then an hour after that coffee is done, if I have not turned that coffee maker off, it will alert the entire household that this is the last chance for hot coffee and then automatically turn that coffee maker off. Um, these are the things that make um, smart home technology uh, enjoyable for people. And I want people to be able to experience that um, and have it easier for them to put in place. Um, and it's getting better. Um, Organizations like Home Assistant is doing an amazing job to ensure as much compatibility with as many devices um, as they can and a, a very easy startup um, process, uh, as well as being able to, to give you the option of if you want to do very simple things um, with automations uh, in your network, um, automations and scripts, um, you can do that. But if you want to get way more complex, you can go as deep as you want into the code and do some very complex routines. Um, if, you, uh, if you know a little bit about how to do uh, program the YAML files, even through their little, um, uh, their little web interface um, dropdown uh, for automations. There's a tremendous amount of stuff that you can do over there. Um, and then you can even install Node-RED and Node-RED um, can be implemented right on your server. So you can do even more complex, like GUI driven stuff. Um, those are the things that are going to make it better. But Home Assistant is really great because they have worked to make things as compatible and generic as possible. Um, and the best implementations that I've seen with Home Assistant um, combine these devices that provide uh, a non-cloud-based um, connection to a device and control of that device. Um, and that also uh, devices that use MQTT um, because Home Assistant, I have an MQTT server on my Home Assistant server. Um, they are one and the same and it has made things so much easier uh, for doing stuff. So that's how you produce, uh, that's how you reduce the headache. Um, creating devices that are really meaningful to people is another really big thing. Um, I am literally shocked that no one has created a consumer product um, that is a smart mirror. Um, it's literally a, a computer screen behind a one-way mirror um, that can display information. Um, it's not a super diff difficult thing. I have a mirror near my front door that I use to check um, just before I walk out the door to see if I don't have anything on my face or something. Um, but uh, I would love to be able to, uh, while I'm checking that before I leave, see my bus schedule on there, see what the weather is gonna be like, see what's on my calendar um, right before I walk out the door. Um, I, I don't understand why a company hasn't made a consumer product that's like that. The closest I've seen is something called a smart mirror that is literally just a mirror with two lights down the side and you can use Alexa to turn those lights on and off. Um, and that's it. That is pathetic. 
um, uh, the the other thing that I have seen um, that uh, is kind of a smart mirror is um, this thing I keep seeing advertised in Facebook um, where it's like a full length mirror that you work out in front of and it displays essentially what looks like a, a YouTube video of a fitness instructor um, behind the mirror and some of your health stats or something uh, on it. Uh, it's, it's great if you're if you're working out, but I think it's a hugely missed opportunity that it doesn't serve some other functions. I mean, come on, if you're going to invest that much in the technology, make a smart mirror that can also perform as a fitness workout mirror. Um, it's uh, devices like that are really going to make us um, excited about things. We don't need another um, internet connected microwave or another slightly better video camera or doorbell sensor um, or really any of these things. Um, I would suggest to people to look to the maker community um, and what uh, we're doing with uh, Internet of Things to see some of the, the like truly amazing stuff. Um, things that I've made and things that, that other people that I've seen have made are, are astonishing. Like what we are able to do with technology like these chips, the ESP8266. This is a $3 chip. It's tiny and it's more than enough to drive a whole bunch of full colored LEDs. Um, and, uh, and, and this is the small version of it. The, there exists stuff that's way more complicated um, than that and it, that can do so much more. Um, so yeah, let's really ask more of these companies um, than just tightening up um, their existing standards and uh, of course, you know, we have the power to change this um, by supporting companies that we think are doing a good job um, and asking those companies that aren't doing a good job um, to start doing better. Um, and uh, hopefully these companies will eventually start listening to the people who are developing stuff in a way that excites people. Um, so. That's pretty much all I have to say about that. Um, well, I have, I have a lot more to say about um, things like this. So I'm hoping to do a lot more of these videos, um, these types of videos and videos in general um, in the future. Um, yeah, of course, like and subscribe if you, um, if you wanna check out more stuff. Uh, I'm gonna try and do at least a video every week. Um, possibly even like short ones every day or so um uh, as much as yeah you know, as much as i feel like i can but um what i'd really like to hear uh if you want to comment is i'd love to hear what your thoughts are on amazon's um rollout of all the different products that they have relating to smart home technology um uh, tell me about your experiences and headaches with smart homes. Um, if you want to talk about like the gear that you have and um, some of the awesome routines that you've set up, that'd be cool too. Um, but um, yeah. All right. Hope you enjoyed this. See you guys later.